Mm. Pardon? You look young. <laughs> <gasps> I'm. No, not till four o'clock. Oh, I. Good afternoon. Today is March 25th, 2017. My name is Wayne Madsen. I am conducting oral history interview at the American Legion Post 321 in New Baden, Illinois, with Vince Rovis. Well, but actually, okay, that's my first name. Okay, my my grandma didn't like Rovis, so I said, "Well, I'm gonna call him Vince." That's my middle name. Okay. All right. Um, see. My name is Wayne Madsen. My address is 1197 Mary Irene Road, New Baden, Illinois. And Vince, you want to give your full name and uh, address, please? Okay, my full name is Wilbert Vincent Ralvis, and I live at 1420 Mullican Street in Carlisle, Illinois. Okay. Uh, you were in World War II, correct? That's right. Okay. Uh, you were drafted, right? Yeah, I sure was. I gotta get some, you gotta ask me some dates here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, how, how old were you when you were drafted, Vince? About 18. 18, okay. Were you, where were you living at the time when you got drafted? In, in Elbows, Illinois. Okay. Out on the farm. Were you single or married yet? Single. Single? Just a kid. <laughs> okay. When you got drafted, were you able to choose which branch of the service you went in, or they just told you you were going Army? They just told me this is it. Okay. <laughs> what was, uh, um, what do you first recall when you first went in the Army? Pardon? What do you recall when you first went to boot camp when you were first went in the army? What were I called? What, what was your memories of? What, what do you remember from your first few days, few weeks when you were in the army? You mean not what? Well, like when you were down at boot camp, did you have any uh, anything stand out when you first went down there? No, not really. Look, just won the old troops, sir. Okay. Just all in line. <laughs> Hurry up and wait. Um, what was what was your experience like at boot camp and your training? Oh, it was all different. It was, I just I just went along with what I had to do, and I didn't really have no big experience at all. I thought they were kind of rude sometimes, but I guess <laughs> that was the way of doing things. Where did you go to boot camp at? Fort McClellan, Alabama. Fort McClellan, Alabama. Uh, did you go to, after boot camp, did you go to the school or did they send you straight to the war after boot camp? After my 13 weeks of basic training, they gave me 10 days leave, leave, um, a leave in route. And I had a chance to come home for a few days and then I had to report back to Fort Meade, Maryland. Okay. And then from there, I caught the old ship to North Africa, Casablanca is where I landed at. Did you uh, have any special buddies while you were in boot camp? You got oh, I had some friends from Clinton County that were with me. Okay. For a little while. I don't know if you ever knew the Kennets or not. I've heard of the Kennets. Okay. Charlie Kennett, he used to work in the bank. He was drafted the same time I was, so he was with me. And then there's another guy by the name of Gene Miller. He was from around Aviston area. He was with me. And then I had one, I didn't know him at the time, but he's from Carlisle. It was um, Bookie Worms. I can't even call his first name anymore, but that was his nickname, Bookie. And he's just a young troop, just like myself. But then we soon separated after we got to Scott Air Base. That's where I was inducted at. Okay. And they went one way and well, Bucky Worm stayed with me and Dean Miller stayed with me through basic training. And that was kind of nice to have somebody around there that I knew, half we knew anyway. Yeah. Did they go to North Africa with you? No. I didn't have nobody I knew there. Okay. I guess it's all according to the alphabet or something. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now you said you went to uh, Casablanca, North mm -hmm. Africa. Yeah. Um, what was it like when you first got there? What? What was it like when you first got to Africa? Oh, just a big sand dune. See them Arabs riding around with them white horses like crazy. <laughs> and it's still your mind. We had, we lived in a tent and they had double guards. One going this way, that way. And they just watched that one. When there's a port, they'd slip in and get in our, our, our tents while we was out doing some training. Oh, really? And they finally had to put on another guard and make sure it would never be a part like that. It, it was terrible. It, it was one day we had a, I guess you might say a day off, and they said, oh, you go into town, and we did. And here was my buddy's uh, duffel bag. He cut holes in, him in the corner and pulled, him up, pulled a string tight. And his name stenciled right across his butt. <laughs> he, he wanted to go after him, kill him. I said, no, no, don't do that. I talked him out of it. Otherwise, he got after him. He'd have been in big trouble if he would have. So. <clears throat> so, um, what was what was your uh, job in the army? Well, we really didn't have a job. Just strictly training, cleaning weapons, and and do the job out on the front lines. So basically infantry? Yeah, well that, that was it. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Where did you uh, first see combat then? Italy. Italy? Mm -hmm. What part? You remember? Well, pretty close to Naples. Naples, Italy? Yeah. And then we went right on, on through in them hills and mountains and it was in the winter time. By the time we got, well it was September. And it was starting to get cold already. And in, in the winter time, there's snow on the ground. And like I told some of them guys in the Air Force, I said, you guys are lucky. If you don't get shot down tonight, you can go back and get a hot bath, a nice hot meal and go in a nice warm bed, get up the next morning, get dressed and go about your business. I said, well, we sleep at? <coughs> well, I guess in a tent. I said, no, we don't still have a tent when you're on the front line. You lay the army blanket down and lay on half of it, cover the other half over you and with one eye over and, and the finger on the trigger. That's what you do when you're in the army and in the infantry. Oh, I wouldn't like that. I, said, I didn't like it either. <laughs> About 18, 20 degrees out there. Oh. I think I've been cold ever since. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, did you see a uh, combat right away then when you got to Italy or? Pretty, pretty quick. We, we went from our, I guess, home base there in Italy. That's where we landed at. We had, had 10 city there. And we was there for about maybe three or four days. And then one night the sergeant come in and said, okay, all you guys out fully dressed for combat. Okay, we had our rifles, we had our ammo belts and everything. We marched, I don't know how far maybe a couple of miles. Man, it was cold, but I got hot. I had that big old uh, army field jacket. I had like a blanket in, lining inside. And then I had a combat pants, and they were made just like it. Just like little bib overhauls. I had to shed my coat. And all of a sudden, it's open. Quiet. So then we relieved another bunch of people there, GIs. And they went back, and we filled their positions. That's when we started in the war. Started dodging bullets, as I say. <coughs> it, was, it was not nice, I'll tell you. <coughs> um, what was, uh, did you have any uh, close uh, buddies when you were over in Italy, or? Well, just the ones that you get acquainted with while you're in service and right there on the spot. In fact, at one time I was a BAR gunner and I had a guy that had to carry my bandoliers. I couldn't carry it all and he was right with me. And I had a, quite a bad experience with that. I mean, it was getting pretty rough and the enemy was fighting back pretty hard. And well, we had to move up a little every now and then. So, oh, we moved probably 
be like from here to the edge of the new bay in the west end, and then we hit the deck, find a place to kind of dodge the bullets again. And here come my gunner, he jumps into kind of a hole with me there, and I said, where's the ammunition? Holy stuff, we got it. Oh, no. I said, oh, no. I didn't have much ammunition there, you know. I said, as soon as quiet is on, you get back over and get it. Okay, well, he was just a nervous wreck, you know. So he went back, and he didn't come back. And I heard some loud booms going and dropping mortar fire, whatever it was. So I started going back when it kind of died down looking for him. And he was, his head laying over there, and part of the body laying in that hole there. And boy, I'll tell you what, that really butt raised cause quits right there. <laughs> it was bad. So I had to notify my sergeant. He had to get me somebody else to take his job. And I'll tell you, I, I, I dream about that. It's pretty bad. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I just, it reminded me of an experience I had. Oh, um, when, when was it uh, you got captured? I got captured on the, um, take it a minute. On the 14th day of December, 1943. Oh. For December 14th, mm -hmm. 1943. How long, that was in Italy, right, where you got captured? Yeah. And I was shot and I took a bullet right in my left ankle. And that's when I was captured and everything. And when the whole thing ended for me real quick. <clears throat> and we had a great big mountain we were trying to take it back from this side. And every time we try, try to get over it, they just bomb the hell, or shoot the hell out of that mountain, top of the fire on it. Had a withdrawal. And we done that about two or three different times. Finally, well, C Company, and that's where I was at. Can you Always got the fire. Okay. <coughs> I should have laid these out. What? Oh, okay. 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 We were at where he got shot. Okay. And we, so Company C, as you always, know, they get the dirty deal all the time, C Company. Okay, C Company is going to go through a dry riverbed all the way around and come up from this side. That's what we were supposed to make the Germans think. We're going to lock this door. And, uh, so he's about, well, I guess maybe about eight or ten of us, all the way around that. We started out, I think, about two o'clock in the morning. And about time of break of day, we were just getting around that big curve there. And one mountain was like this, like a slope, and the one on our side was just like a cliff. So boy, all of a sudden, man, them Germans shooting right down that river, man, hitting them rocks with sparks were just flying everywhere. And so while well, we just pulled up alongside the mountain, they couldn't see nobody. So all of a sudden, just like somebody dropped a cigarette butt right on my ankle. Ooh, I thought it was a rock that flew and hit me there. Well, I mean, that sucker hurt. So I stood there a little bit and I looked. I seen the blood who was down in my shoe. I, I told my buddy there standing right next to me. I said, you know, I said, I think I got shot. I said, I see the blood coming out of my shoe. Oh, shit, he said, that's bad. I said, yeah. My lieutenant, he was right there with us. He had a little carbine. You know what that is? No, I do not. It's, a, it's an officer's rifle. Okay. A lot lighter than the M1. He walked right out in the middle of the on the riverbed. He said, where's the SOB is at? He just well had a BB gun out there. Man, they start really shooting down that rear bed, and they caught him right through both sides. One here, one there, halfway between the ankle and the hip. He fell down on the, on the rock. So we grabbed him and pulled him up 
to the cliff, you know. Some place had a big like, belly out there, and you hide, hope you can hide behind it, but when you're on the other side looking right at you, you can't hide. So, well, we just laid there. I, I stood there, took my rifle, and I used it like a cane. I stood on one leg and with my gun butt on the ground. <coughs> All day, from about daylight that morning till just about dark. Then them Germans come down off that hill. The sloping side was full of brush, underbrush. And he had a little damn, I we called the burp gun. He looked me right in the face and he said, for you the war is finished. I knew damn well if he pulled the tree it would be. But they, they wasn't there to kill us. They was there to take us prisoner. So my lieutenant, he lay there, he said, guys, he said, don't fight back. He said, they'll get us all. And I said, okay, well, all I had was my gun and I was leaning on it. So then here come a whole bunch of German soldiers about, and there's two of them, they had like an axe handle. And they held on to it and they said, sit them. You're supposed to sit on that and get on their shoulders, you know. So I sat down, they carried me upside the mountain, put me on a big old, like a three-quarter ton flatbed truck. <coughs> Little sides on me about that high. So, just before that happened, my, our lieutenant gave the order, he said, just, just drop your guns. He said, we're done. So then the Germans come and picked us all up. I was on that back end of the truck and down to the mountains. And our, our auto was shelling up in there, and I could just about heat, feel the heat from our, our gun and, uh, shells that were dropping back short behind the truck. I said, just about see any time now, one can drop right in the middle of the darn truck and blow us all to hell. But that guy was going like hell, a driver, and we could see what the distance got between us and the shells. Then he took us into a barn. Oh, I don't know, I bet we was maybe 10 miles away from the front line. And they left us there that night. And the next morning, the commandant come in, looked us over. And my lieutenant still had his 45 strapped on him yet. Now, old oh, man, and I, I do understand a little German. And they were talking about that gun. And I told my lieutenant, I said, just lay still. I said, you still got your gun on him. Put it like this. He's going to reach down. I said, no, no, no. Keep your hand up above your head. I said, if you reach down, I said, they'll think you're going to shoot him. And about that time, that commandant gave one of them GIs, his soldiers, orders to get that gun. They like to his pants off to get that damn gun out of his holster. Oh, man, I, I hate, hate like hell to have been that guy that took him in there and didn't, didn't search him. <coughs> and so we laid there for, I guess, about a day. Then they moved us on to some place, but I, I don't remember where it was at. But then they had a Siberian doctor there, and they ha had me in like a little doctor's office. And he said something in Siberian, I couldn't understand him. So he started cutting the shoelace off my shoe. I still had my shoe on yet. I thought he was going to take the whole leg off. Then blood was soaked, dried to my sock. And my, Sock was dried to my shoe, and my foot was about that big. Well, he <clears throat> all of a sudden he got it new. Uh, he didn't clean it up. He didn't wash the blood off or anything. Just put a cast on all the way up to here. And I don't know why. Anybody got a broken ankle? Sure as hell ain't gonna run anyway. But they made damn sure I didn't. You couldn't run with a cast all the way up to your hip. <clears throat> so then. I'm thinking they put us on a train and they moved us to stock 13D. And it was, no, I take it back. We wound up in, uh, in the civilian hospital that was taken over by the Germans. And the name of that hospital was um, Cartino Diem Paso. That was the area that we was at. I don't know what the name of the hospital that was. That was in Germany? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that was in Italy. Oh, it's still in Italy, yeah, okay. Cartino. It was a ski ski area, sorry, resort. Okay. And I laid there, that's when that Italian girl came in and wrote that note. And I sent it home. She got it through there, I don't know how she did. But anyway, she got it home. 
And you know, I, you try to go to the bathroom and sit on a commode with a stiff leg, <laughs> you can't do it. So they assigned another prisoner of war to be with me any time I have to go. He helped me to get on the, on the stool and he'd hold that one leg up. And I felt sorry for him, but <laughs> I couldn't help it. <laughs> oh, he raised hell. He said, yeah. Damn, he said, ain't you about done? <laughs> All that kind of stuff. So anyhow. That lieutenant that was shot, what you did was he getting treatment there also? Yeah, I I think he I don't remember if he was shot somewhere in his shoulder or in the arm or something. It wasn't a serious wound or anything, but he, he wasn't completely uh, lucky it didn't get nothing. And anyway, he was a POW with me. Right. So I was there for, I'm, I'm going to say about a week. And then he put us on his train and then he took us to slot 13D. And it was just pretty rough there too. And then the same guy went to come along with me again. And then it's another Siberian doctor. And he said, ah. When he looked at me. So he took the cast and cut it off right below the knee. Oh man, that made it so much better. I could bend my knee and I could sit down and whatever. And uh, so I spent, well, I guess almost the biggest part of the that spring and summer there. And then I went to Hammerstein, Germany to start to be with about 18 or 20 guys. And we wound up on the farm, digging potatoes, pulling the root sugar beets out of the ground and doing a thrashing of the nighttime because they needed all the electricity they could get of the daytime to keep the factories going. So we had to use electric of the nighttime. <coughs> all their thrashing mechanisms all electric. Okay. <coughs> so we'd be up there in the hayloft, throwing the bundles down into the thrashing rig. And then on the other end, we had two guys there, two grain, two spouts. When this sack would get full, we'd sit over and then go on the other side. Tie that and shut and carry that, put it on like a pallet, <coughs> and stick another empty one on this side, back and forth. And that's the way we thrash the grain. So we stayed there and worked on a farm till early in 1944. <coughs> Excuse me a minute. Get my whistle. Then we could start hearing the Russian gunfire. It was moving into Germany. And all of a sudden we got orders we had to move. January 1st, packed our little stuff up that we had and started marching. <coughs> we marched for a full, I know 45 days, maybe better. <coughs> We'd march in the daytime, sleep in the barn in the nighttime if a, a barn was available. So, and it was darn cold. It was zero or 20 below every night, uh, almost in the east pressure, Polish, Poland, uh, Polish, Poland area. And uh, a couple of nights, we didn't find a barn. Well, what are you going to do? You don't march until tomorrow morning. A couple of us guys get together and lay one blanket down and lay on that. And we, everybody had one blanket each and pulled the other two blankets over us to keep from freezing to death. And that's the way we made it until I met we met way down almost in the middle of Germany. And they said, well, that's far enough. We didn't hear any more Russian ammunition going off or anything. So they put us back on the farm, and they picked me and another guy. And the Germans are no dummies. They know whether he's a farmer or whether he's a railroader or whatever. So we put us on the farm, and we had to take care of about 36 cows or better. And it's okay. Take care of them. You feed them, you water them, you clean the barn, you milk them, and that's by hand, not by a machine. I had about 16 cows to milk every morning and night. Oh, the first day or two, I thought my arms would break. I couldn't hardly 
میخش مشاهد میشه درک کنه یعنی یه شو نه دورایی هم شو دن اگر all of a sudden here damn Russian tank come moving right in in the area where we was at boy the surveyors they just disappeared you didn't see none of them I don't know where the hell they went to so quick but they was gone the only thing we had was the two guards that was guarding us they were diehards they're going to keep us POWs you know well it didn't take them Russian long to take care of them guys so then they shot the lock off the gate so okay guys out so then they showed us to go to the Alb River. The Americans were on the other side of the Alb, building a bridge across there. And they said they'll probably pick you up as soon as they get the bridge done. Okay, so we, I, I, I know that must have been uh, 35 or 40 miles, every bit of that, away from where we was at. <coughs> so okay, so we got everything together. Yeah, oh man, they were complaining. And we was all just about that big around. How in the hell are we going to carry all our junk? Just leave it behind. I said, well, I see an old oxen standing way back there. I said, we've been using that son of a gun for around the farm. We hook him to the wagon, put all our belongings on there, and here we go. Hey, that was a good idea. So we put all our stuff on the wagon, which we didn't have much, it, it, none of us had much more than a, than a change of clothes, that was about all we had, maybe a razor or something. Well, we started out trying to get us, eat off the fat of the land, but there wasn't much left. <clears throat> on about the second day, that old officer, he just petered out, Bleh. he just dropped, he couldn't make it no more. I know he's old enough to vote. So, now what are we going to do? I said, well, I'll be ashamed of that all that T-bone sink laying back here and walk away from it. <coughs> I said, you guys find me a good sledgehammer somewhere. And we were like a, around the farm area. And we sent out about three or four guys to find a big hammer. No use to find a gun because that was out of the question. So they came back with a pretty good size sledgehammer. And it's okay. Now I'm going to hit him in the head. Now. That'll kill him dead in the mackerel. And then one said, Yeah, well, how how we get the blood out of him? I said, Well, you got to have a good sharp knife and cut his throat and bleed him like you do a hog or anything. Because I was used to being around the farm butchers and stuff. So I hit that stuff in the head about three times. We get him where he died off. And they, a couple of guys, they cut his throat. So then, we went to the back hind quarter and we just seen that one whole hind quarter out. And I said, well guys, how much do you want? Cut them off a couple of meat, but it was in the May, pretty warm, we couldn't carry it with us very long. Maybe long enough for a day or so, it would be spoiled. So we each got enough meat to survive on for two days. And then every time that we'd want to eat, we'd get an old rod somewhere to find a farmhouse and find some kind of iron and then hang it up on a, on a peg on either side and build a big fire and let it cook. It wasn't all that great with no salt, no pepper, no nothing. But, and it was beef jerky, I'll tell you. And that old oxen was tough. <laughs> but we, we managed to get a little something to eat off of him anyhow for two days. And then we got up to the Alb River after a couple of days of marching. And oh, there was all kinds of POWs there. They come in from all different parts of the country there. From what uh, the Russians, what they, they're the ones that got all those POWs released? They, or, or I, I don't know who released okay. them. Okay. Most of them naturally were because there was no American troops around yet. They was on the other side of the Alps. So I, I'd say we probably had about 50 or 60 POWs gathered there at the Alps River. And then about the very next day, the helicopter came over, dropping the leaflets, telling us to stay right there. They just, they just about had the uh, bridge complete over the Alb, and they'd be by and pick us up. So uh, the next day, here they come, about four or five, six or six, picked us up and took on the other side, and it was back into our own 
military and they deal out they give us clean clothes and then they start feeding us but it wasn't very damn much time. Me, I can, should prepare more of a meal here than that. And then they told us that you guys are so undernourished if you feed you a lot, he said, you kill, we'll kill you. So, okay. Kind of nibble on the food they had. And about another two or three days, they flew us to the heart of France. Man, they had a regular army garrison there. Boy, first thing we want to do is go to the beach and get a candy bar or something. <laughs> and you couldn't, we couldn't eat a full candy bar. You get sick, it's just deathly sick. So they shut the BX down and we couldn't get in. No way. We went, what we put in our mouth was come out of the mess hall. Well, we'd get a little ice cream sometimes and food, but nothing real. And we could really load up on it. And we stayed there for, I don't know, maybe a week. And then they put us on a plane. No. Then the, the ship come into the harbor on the on a ocean side. They said, okay, and you guys want to go to, uh, there was that name in New York. No, 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 in France. Again, look at I don't remember the name of the place. The real highest hot spot in France. Everybody goes there when they go on vacation. <laughs> Paris? Paris? Paris, yeah, that's it. So he said, you guys can have a, have a pass for two-day pass and go to Paris if you want to. But if your ship comes in before you get back, you'll have to stay here until the next one comes in. It may come in within a couple of days. It might be a month or two before another one comes in. Not too many guys went to Paris. <laughs> and I said, I know damn well I'm not going there. So then the ship come in about the next day. Got on that and they wound up in New York. In New Jersey, I guess. And then we got on the B&O. And they, they asked us, said, hey, where do you want to go? Do you have, are you from Missouri? You go to Jefferson Barracks. If you're from Illinois, you go to Fort Sheridan. And I had a guy there, he was from St. Louis. And I got to know him in the meantime. And he said, hey, he said, do you have any relatives in, in Missouri? I said, yeah, I got an uncle living in St. Louis. He said, do you know his address? I said, yeah. He said, give him that address. He said, you go to Jefferson Barracks and I'll go there too. If we get there, he said, I'll take you home. I said, I don't live about 50 miles from St. Louis. Yes, that's the way it went. And we got to be good friends. And then we get home for 90 day furlough, rehabilitation furlough. And as soon as that was over, we went back to Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And that's when we finished off and got our discharge and come back home. That was it. Now, uh, did you receive any, after you were free, did you receive any medical attention for your ankle? Oh, yeah. I was going to John Cochran there for a little while. <clears throat> and then he started sending me to Marion, since I was from Illinois. I had to go there to Chicago. And then, fortunately, in later years, they got a clinic over here in Belleville. They got one in Mount Vernon. And I'm sure I'd go in there. So when, when you were uh, got free over in France, they never looked at you there? You, you didn't get looked at till you got stateside? No. They just ask you how you feel. And, oh, hell, I feel great. I'm ready to go home. <laughs> <laughs> I went from 185 pounds down to 102 in them 18 months as a prisoner of war. Wow. <laughs> I always tell, tell most people now, I said, yeah, I'm going to lose weight. I said, I can give you the formula. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, back to when you were a POW, uh, anyone from your unit, were they with you there, or were you separated from your unit oh, when you were yeah. a POW? Yeah, just individual. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> now, uh, Last time we did this, you mentioned a story about uh, when you were milking cows, how you and another guy um, yeah. 
Uh, kept the guard occupied. Yeah, I got it in here, but I don't think we got to that yet. No. <coughs> we might have skipped over that for some reason. Yeah, when we moved to the second setting, when the Germans come in, they, they moved us from uh, East Prussia area into the middle of Germany when we marched in 45 days. Then they said, well, we're far enough away to Germany, or the Russian thing will get us now. So then they put us back on the work du duty. And they, you and you, will put you on, in charge of them cows out there. And then milking them damn cows was pretty rough. And guards sitting on each end of the morning with their rifles. And somebody making noise over that way, my buddy went. And they'd look at him and squirt a little milk in your mouth and get a little milk that way. And then all of a sudden they'd look on a swine hunt, you know. Why well, they jerk their rifle? They ready to bayonet it to death. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now once in a while we get a little nip of milk, but that didn't help too much. Yeah. What was your uh, meals like when you were a POW? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I know we had cereal in the morning for breakfast. I do remember that meal, Bob. Yeah, and then we had light food, very, very little meat, vegetables mostly. <clears throat> uh, did the, uh, your, your soup you told me one time, what uh, the Germans put broken glass in there for you? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, did you ever read that story? Well, you told it to me that that's how I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was black bread. Yes, the black bread. The, or... first, the first day when it was fresh, it was kind of pliable. <coughs> but by another day or two later, you could have built a house on it. It was like a concrete block. And you said that the soup had live maggots in it. Hmm? You said that the soup had live worms in it. Oh, yeah. Maggot soup. That's for sure. They'd come out, when we were in a prison war camp, they'd come out with a five gallon milk can full of soup. Real stringy meat, it looked like it was horse meat. And you could they'd take a cabbage head and just cut it in three or four pieces, drop it in there. Them cabbage warm down in there. It wasn't going like that, they'd just be floating on top of the soup. Somebody said, Did you eat this? Eat them critters? I said, Well, just depends on how hungry you was. If you felt like he was hungry, you just dig in like hogs eating salt. <laughs> Otherwise, you kind of try to push him back. But there's so darn many of them in there that you couldn't do that. Now yeah. the, um, what they had the broken glass in that soup also, didn't no, they? No, in the bread. Oh, it was the bread that had the glass. Yeah. Okay. You couldn't drown the glass. In. I don't know if we ever got any of it or not. It was probably so fine that you wouldn't even know it. They had it made it with sawdust. Okay. Look. Yeah. Now, uh, um, what was your uh, your barracks when you were a POW? What was when you were milking the cows? Uh, what type of barracks they had you? How was that? Well, we didn't have much. <clears throat> there for a while, we slept in the barn with the cows. Okay. Yeah, and then of course. It was, it was really better than in the barracks. In the barracks, you didn't have nothing. Here in Barton, we had hay. You throw half a blanket down and lay on top of it, and you get enough darn hay to just, all you had to do was put it over on top of the blanket. And you kind of nest down in there to keep warm. And the next morning, they, the Germans would get you out of bed, I'll tell you for sure. <laughs> Loaf. Take that damn gun on the bed and poke around and see if you get you out of bed. And you get out of bed real quick. Now, how many of you uh, slept in the barn? Yeah, uh, I guess about 20 of us. Uh, I worked party, and they done other chores around the farm. Okay. But we were just strictly assigned to the cows. So you and that well, was it? Just you and one other guy that did all the milking, right? We'd get up about three o'clock in the morning, turn the cows loose, clean the barns, put the feed down on the on the in the crib, you know, when they fed them out of them. Then we stand there pumping water. Oh, they had a 
cattle trough there, there's a lot of them doing that ball. And if we have it full and turn, turn the cows loose, within about five minutes, that darn thing is about half empty. Start pumping water again. Uh, felt like your arm was breaking. And then my buddy said, well, here, let me take it for a while. He'd pump for a while. And finally, the cows would walk away, they had enough. Then we put them back in the morning, and then we get our milking utensils out and we start milking them. Get all that done by about 9 o'clock in the morning. Now you're done. Till this afternoon sometime, then you go back again. Did you have to do anything between milking times then? No, it was, it was off. We just drove up by the time and hail off and take a little nap. Try to figure out what we're going to get to eat, you know. Of course, they come with that damn milk can with that soup. And that was not what we got, a loaf of bread. <clears throat> Our main ration was usually a cup of soup and about a slice of bread off that black bread about that thick. That was a ration for the day. Oh. You could never run it or you could eat it all at one time, any which way you want to do it. Now, did the Red Cross ever come and check on the prisoners? Never, never heard of them. You told me the Red Cross sent you some stuff and they stole it. Yeah, I'm getting ready to tell it right now. <laughs> then the Red Cross provided a 47 pound food parcel for the prisoners of war every, every, every month. Okay, I, I think we, I got maybe about three of them the whole time I was there. But while we was on the march from one destination to the other, we sleep in the barn. Here's a darn stack of red part cross parcels as high as the ceiling back at one end of the barn, all empty. The Germans made help them pretty damn good. Then hmm. <coughs> you had a can of corned beef in a can, then you got a pound of butter, a uh, can of salmon or sardine, whatever. And maybe eight packs, eight cigarettes in a pack, you get about two of them. And we found that's why I started smoking. <clears throat> if you smoke a cigarette, that would really cut your hunger pains. And boy, everybody was smoking. <clears throat> um, when you came back stateside, was was any of the PLWs you were with were on the same ship with you or? Yeah, up until New York. Okay. And then they went every which way to their own home. And we had it from down south and up, up north, Iowa, Minnesota. We had it from all over, you know. <coughs> that gentleman from Missouri you met, was he a PLW also? Oh yeah. Now, was he with you or or did you just meet him in France? I met him as a POW. Not, he was with their outfit. <coughs> but the pretty part about it was once he took me home, he invited me to come back to St. Louis to see him. And we got to be real good friends for a while. Mm -hmm. And then I got married and he got married and he went his way and I went mine. And I started into the trucking business. And one day I come in from, from work and well, I said, oh, said, you got a letter here. She, I don't know, it's a man out of Missouri. Probably somebody looking for a job. I opened it up. Well, I knew right away who it was. His wife had wrote the letter. She said, we got three children and a half dozen dogs. And we live on a small farm. We would like for you to come over and visit with us for a weekend. Well, the wife was working at the shoe factory at the time, and my trucking wasn't all that great, just hauling grain to and from the elevator. So I, my wife had a sister there we lived with. She was pretty good. She could drive the trucks too, had to be, which she had been doing for me, helping me out. So she just took the keys and hung them up on the wall. And if the farmers would call, she said, well, you want to use the truck? Well, come and get it, and you can use it. So, me and the wife, we went down to Missouri. We stayed for about a week. Man, I'll tell you the best time we ever had. <coughs> and they did live in a pretty, pretty shabby house. 
I think it was a three room house, and they had a kitchen and two bedrooms. One bedroom for the kids and one for the so we stayed there. We were going to get go into town and get a motel. Oh, no, no, you're going to stay right here. You're our company. They took all the kids and put them in a bedroom with them. And we had the one bedroom then to sleep by. <laughs> Again, we got biscuits, homemade biscuits for breakfast. <laughs> well, that was something. What about the other two Vincents you were saying, the POWs? The other two Vincents from Albers. Dewey oh, and yeah. Johnson. There were three Vincents from Albers in POWs in Germany. Vince Ralvis, Vince Dewey, and Vince... Um, Johnson. Johnson. Sparky, I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. No, I have not. Okay. But I did meet Vince Dewey in uh, in Lerner-Sala for a short time. He was a ranger, but he got captured. So one day I'm walking across the yard there, and we met, and he spoke. Boy, that duly profiled, I, I couldn't forget. Everybody had their heads shaved, keep the bugs off them. And I said, do I know you? Yeah, he said, I like that. I think, he said, I know you. And I said, he said, are you from Albers? And I said, yeah. I said, oh, I hear Dooley. Yeah, he said. Then he didn't come up with my name, and I told him. Then we got big friends right there for about three or four days. All of a sudden, he's gone. And then I got to ask him some of the other people are still there yet. Oh, he said, they all shipped out yesterday. They went to a different style. I said, let me down. And well, then after we got back home, I met him, and I met Sparky. Sparky was a good friend of ours from, from kid on that. But then Vince Dooley went duck hunting sometime or other, and I guess he had the gun laying on the boat. When he come in from duck hunting, he pulled the boat up on the, up on the dry land, and the damn gun somehow went off and shot him. Oh, no. Well, then at least that's the word we got. And that was kind of a sad deal there, I'll tell you. <clears throat> yeah. The, um, what, the other guy, Sparky from Albers? Yeah. Did you ever keep in touch with him afterwards? Oh, yeah, yeah. We drank quite a bit of beer together. <laughs> go out together. We double date and stuff like that. And then he moved to Carlisle and I was living there. We all belonged to the BFW there and the Legion. So we get pretty well acquainted. <clears throat> In fact, my mom was telling me that she worked for Sparky's family when them kids were little in diapers. And my wife wasn't married then yet. She was the older one, not the younger one. Sparky was one of the younger ones. Okay. Oh, Doug, the kids too. <laughs> now, did that help you at all? You know, you know, knowing someone in Albers that went through the same experience you did as a POW? Oh, it, it probably did. Uh, and then we got organized with the XPOW chapter, uh, chapter XPOW, and we got, oh, 15 or 20 counties, and we all, we just like the Legion, you know. Uh -huh. We have a meeting once a month, but we had quite a few of them. They get talking back and forth. And we talk more free to talk. And at first, nobody wanted to say too much of anything. You couldn't pry it out of us. We wouldn't say nothing. I don't know if it was thought that it was a shame to be a POW or whatever it was. I don't know. But anyhow, we finally loosened up and got to talk. And we, we have good times together. That's good. Now, you mentioned, you know, about, you know, not opening up. You know, at first, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't know, you know, being ashamed, you know, for being a POW. Yeah. Did anyone ever give you grief for being a POW? Did that ever happen back then? You what? Did anyone ever give you a hard time or other POWs oh, no. a hard time for being a POW? No. The only trouble that I had, and it was really disgusting, I get home on a 90 day leave. My folks were living on the farm yet. And this time that I got home, they were thrashing. They didn't have combines then yet. 
and they'd go out in the field, pick up the bottles and put them on a wagon, haul them in and throw them in a separator and slash the weed out. And I, I used to do that when I was a kid, you know, carry a jug of water out to the field. And I said, hell, I ain't doing anything. I just got me a big old jug of water so it and so it back in my car and I knew about there and brought the water out to the guys out there loading the wagons. And this one guy's on the wagon. And, oh, man, she said, oh, damn. He said, what the hell are you beating? He said, I hadn't seen you for a while. In the meantime, they were, his whole family, they had about four boys, none of them went to the service. Every time he got close to the draft, the old man buy another for him, throw a couple of cows on him, he's sporting them. That exempted him from draft. Right. And then he asked me, where the hell have you been? Oh, I want to tell him some damn bad. I was out there getting my ass shot off while he was dodging the war. But I never said nothing, I just let it go. But it was pretty, pretty hard to swallow. <clears throat> Other than that, no, everybody was pretty nice about it. Okay. Well, that's, that's, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, were you, um, medals or citations did you receive a few while you were in there? Yeah, I got a, got a few up there at home. Um, I've got them all in a real nice container. Can you name them? Hmm? Can you name them for her? Yeah, I, I can't think of one. No. Like I got the infantry combat badge, I got the good conduct medal, I got a purple heart. I got a bronze star, I got the silver star. I got all that stuff. And probably a few more I can't even think of right now. But my my nephew and his wife, they put it all together in a real nice little shadow box for you? Yeah, but just something that you put in a shadow box where you can hang it on the wall or whatever you want to do with it. Um, when you were in the service, you know, you mentioned when you were in uh, Italy, when you had that nurse contact your family, you know, to let them know you were a POW. Was there a, a be before you became a POW, did you stay in contact with your family or was that hard at that time or? Uh, it was pretty rough. Being in combat, you know, you'd be at front lines for maybe about a week or ten days, then you'd come back to the rest area. You needed that rest, I'll tell you for sure. Sometimes I'd get, sit down and write a little letter and send it home, but not too, too often, not too many of them. And when we was in the, con in the prison camp, we was allowed one letter and one postcard uh, a month. To send home. Okay. And my folks had some of the letters I wrote all blacked out, censored. Uh -huh. <laughs> you couldn't hardly make out what, what I had wrote. You just censored everything. I don't know why they do that, but they did. Um, was there any uh, uh, guards, German guards that you had that, you know, <coughs> That was nice to you, or as lean, you know? Yeah, I'll get to that one too. I just <coughs> kind of forgot about that one. We had two um, German guards with our outfit that we well, we stayed at, <coughs> and that one guard, guard was an English teacher in Germany, and he could speak fluent English just like we do. And he had a wife and one daughter. Well, I guess the daughter was about nine, ten years old. Come about Christmas time, he said, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, me and the wife, we're going to roast a pig, he said, for Christmas. And he said, we're going to bring the dinner over for you guys. Said, hey, that'd be nice. And they did. On Christmas Eve, well, about nine o'clock at night, he had the key to let himself in, you know. So he unlocked the gate and unlocked the door and yeah, don't go here with him. Be quiet, boy. He said them Germans would know that he said he'd cut his throat. Well, so we all sat down and had a nice happy Christmas. And that wasn't too long before we were liberated by the Russians. We always 
getting toward the Elbe River, what did we see? A whole column of German prisoners of war under the Russian, and the Russians were the guards. And as we, we just go one way, just going the other, just about like meeting them on the street. And here was that guard that would give us a nice Christmas dinner. No, we didn't dare. He looked at us and kind of nodded a little bit, but not. I felt sorry for that poor son of a gun, because I know what they've done with him. They sent him to Stalingrad, probably. And I'm damn lucky. When I was liberated, it was about two weeks later, up until that time, I think the Americans and the Russians were allies. But about, about that same time when I was liberated, they got in a big squabble about Berlin, who's going to get half of it or something. Uh -huh. And then they were not our allies anymore, they were our enemy. And then whenever they liberated the prisoners, they wouldn't turn them loose to us, to the American side, they'd take them back to Stalingrad. Well, they took American prisoners back to? Yeah, took them back to Russia. That's what I was told. And I know we had a lot of missing in action people that were never accounted for. <coughs> and I bet they went to Stalingrad and probably worked to death. And I was just darn lucky that it didn't happen a couple of weeks sooner. Yeah. I'd probably been there too. <coughs> um, let's see. Did you um, have anything that was special to you while you were PLW? That, like a good luck charm or anything like that? No. Uh, nothing special there at all. I think. You had your religious things with you. Huh? You had your Catholic religious things with you. Oh yeah, I had my my banner with me from my religion. Okay. And I carried that in my belt for the whole whole time. I, I still got it at home. Okay. Um. Let's see. When you were um. Um, when you finally got back to the United States, did you feel a lot of relief at that time? Oh, yeah. I felt like I was free again, you know. Well, while you were in France, you didn't feel quite as free until you got to the States then, or? I didn't even understand. When, like when you were in France waiting to catch your ship? Oh, yeah. Did you feel like you were free at that time or you were just a little hesitant until mm -hmm. you got stateside? Well, was, I wasn't quite, I didn't feel quite free and yet. Okay. I still had people telling me what the hell to do. <laughs> <clears throat> and once I got home on a 90 day leave, that was kind of rough. I got a car and I got back pay from well, in the it was in the POW camp, we got some military pay. And I'll tell you, I had, had a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. did, did it take you a while to get readjusted to oh, being yeah. free? Yeah, it took a while. Kind of got settled down and know who I really was. Well, I, I, it was pretty wild when I first got home. The booze was a bad thing. The what? The booze. Okay. After you get home, get with your buddy, yeah, let's have another one, you know. <clears throat> and that went on every day. We, we had to come to town to get the mail. Always a good time to go right across the street. And get, had about five of them sitting there. All, <laughs> not all POWs, but discharged right. people in a service. And we'd get talking about different things. And, Kind of forget, hey, this is about enough of this stuff. <laughs> um, when you came, did your parents know you were coming back home or did you surprise them? I don't think they really knew. I guess I kind of moved in on them. And they knew when I was in St. Louis that I think I got word to them somehow. I don't remember how. But I think I got word to them that I was in St. Louis. 
Now, do they have like a welcome back party for you or just let you adjust no, back? We made our own parties. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, then after your 90 day uh, leave, where did you have to go? I had to go to Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Okay. And that's where I got this job. Okay. <clears throat> I was in, um, oh, there's another camp in Texas. I can't think of the name of it right now. And they, they kind of went to give you a physical there. Well, I'm trying to think. I don't think Lackland was, uh, or any no, of those. No, it wasn't Lackland. Okay. The San Antonio area, though, probably right. No, not really. Oh, see, Fort Sam Houston was in San Antonio. Right, but it was that one. Okay, but I, I can't. But that's where you got your physical and everything there. No oh, way. You got your physical when you were getting discharged down there. Yeah, they told me. Well, they, when I was in that hospital area, they didn't tell me I didn't get my discharge. They said, okay. We're going to send you to Fort Sam Houston. And I even got to see the Alamo over there. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was just a few days, boy, you're done. There's your discharge. And then there's oh, about three or four other people there from Chicago. And the one guy owned the car, he, he didn't want to drive it. He was not that far. So he came to me and he said, hey, he said, I know you live on Illinois too. <clears throat> he said, where are you going? I told him, Trenton. Trenton is where I was going to go because that's where I had my car stored with my sister. And he said, well, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll give you a free, free ride. He said, it won't cost you nothing if you drive. Yeah, that was a pretty bad chore, too. There's no interstates like they have now. All the two lane highways. And we left there at San Antonio, I guess, about noon. And man, I, I remember distinctively, I was driving about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, something like a big old bear like jumping out in front of me. <laughs> Boy, man, I'd sit and drive, firstly, and there was no gas station open at night time. You couldn't stop in and have a cup of coffee or anything. The only thing you got through the town, somebody would pull in, but it looked like I had a little life to it. Might get a cup of coffee. And booze was, was out of the question, because you know they didn't want to get, get to drink and go to sleep. Right. And I couldn't do that. But I made it. <laughs> and then he had his, he got behind the wheel and drove Chicago from there. Um, when was that when you, uh, you you got discharged? What? What year was it when you got discharged? In uh, 1946. 1946? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, okay, after you were discharged, did you... Uh, Go to school or just start wor working? I just start working. <clears throat> I said 46. I think it was 45 instead of 46. Okay. <clears throat> I got married in 46. Okay. What, when in 46 did you get married? What month? Uh, October. October? Did, did Were you seeing her before you uh, went in the Army? Just vaguely. Okay. I had her a time or two. But then after I got home, I looked her up again and we started all over. <laughs> <laughs> what was her name? What was her name? Yes. Loretta Thuban. Okay. And then, um. Yeah, we were married for. She died in 2012. Okay. So I had about 60 some years with her. And the poor thing died with Alzheimer's. And I'll tell you, first of all, she either she broke her hip and fell or she fell and broke her hip. But anyway, that happened in 2001. And I took care of her up until just shortly before she died, she had to go to the nursing home. I couldn't have her. She had Alzheimer's so bad. She didn't even know me anymore. <clears throat> A lot of times I'd, I had her in the nursing home. And I'd try to lean on her, kiss her on her cheek, get out of here. <laughs> She calls, calls the nurse and says, who's this guy? Get him out of here. And then she said, no, it's her husband. She wouldn't hear, hear to it. And then maybe 10 minutes later, I'd come in. 
Oh, that's your real friend. And she recognized me. But the first time around, she didn't. <clears throat> that had been tough. And that was pretty tough, yeah. Uh, we no, didn't have no children. So no children, okay. That was even worse yet. <clears throat> okay. Um, was there any other uh, uh, veterans besides that gentleman in Missouri that you kept in contact with after you got out? Not really. Okay. All right. I guess I was just too damn glad to be home, and I just didn't keep paying no attention to anybody else because there's nothing real close to home except in them two Vince's. Uh -huh. I was real close with them until Vince Dooley died and I just had Sparky left. Um, what veterans organizations do you all belong to? Oh, well. <laughs> the VFW? Uh, no, I'll start out this way. XPOW, okay. DAV, okay. VFW and the Legion. Okay. And the Moose Lodge. And the Moose Lodge. <coughs> Oh, life member talk. Okay. So I don't pay no more dues. <laughs> yeah. Um. After after uh, after the war and you were back here, what trucking was your main uh, uh, job back then? When you had your when you were uh, um, driving your grain trucks. Was that what? Your 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 job after you got out of the service, what well, was it? Just uh, driving trucks at that time? I had a business. I hauled anything needed to be hauled. See, first of all, <clears throat> back then they didn't have natural gas yet in Carlisle, so I was hauling a lot, a lot of coal. Customers in town keep warm. Then the farmers got free limestone. The government bought them limestone for about two years. All the farmers out there pay for the hauling. Man, they was putting the limestone down. So, I was hauling milk and then farmers had hauled milk. I said, hey, why don't you get your Levi line bed on your truck and so we'll, we'll let you haul our limestone. Yeah. I had a dump truck, but that, you couldn't do much with that haul limestone, so I got me another truck, put a bee, bee body spreader on it. <coughs> and I'd haul milk in the morning and I had a guy working, he'd come in the morning and work till noon. And I, well, the milk I hauled was going to Peely uh, Pet Milk Plant in Carlisle. Okay. I'd be done about noon. So when he'd park the truck and I'd get in, I'd start hauling lime until about 10, 11 o'clock at night. A lot of times in the morning that darn motor should be warm yet from the night before. <laughs> oh, that, that was a good truck. Good old GMC. <laughs> I mean, I had 200,000 miles on that like a top. Now, um, did you um, do anything else after your trucking, or was that the only thing you did? Well, for a long time. Then what happened? Natural gas come in. And I talked to some of the people in the street. Oh, yes, we, uh, this year you won't have to haul any coal. We just hook, we're going to hook on to natural gas, okay. Wash them off. And finally, I looked at that list and I had more crossed off than what I had left. And I said, you know, in the farmers, and the government had quit buying limestone from the limestone was just almost zilch. You know, I'm in the wrong business here. So I put my application to start air base and got hired. And I sold my business to one of my drivers and I retired Scott Air Force for 30 years in, and I'm, I'm sourcing everything in my life. <clears throat> Get good retirement, decent health insurance, and that's it. I'll go what I want. What did you do on uh, Scott Air Force Base? Well, I hired in as a truck driver. Okay. But the truck driver down there was in a pickup truck. <laughs> that's pretty darn nice. I hauled the big boss around. They had, um, it was like in the lumber uh, yard business. They had a place here in first area, second area. And they had maybe four or five carpenters there, maintenance people. Every morning I had picked up the boss and he'd go around and see who was all there and mark them off on the time, time cards. And I'd done that for, I guess, about oh, five, six months. Oh, man, 
that would be scooping the coal all the hell. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so then, let's see, where did I do then? Well, I went into a warehouse. I had a, had a guy there in town that I knew pretty well. And he was in the, working in the warehouse, and he needed somebody, so he called, he got in touch with somebody at the base, and he got me on the motor pool. I went to the warehouse, start loading and unloading freight trucks and stuff like that. That was pretty nice. So then one of the guys that was working there with us, he was also the engineer on the locomotive. Anytime the Southern Railroad would bring a car in there, We'd have to take it by by our own with our own load of locomotive and haul it around on the base wherever it had to be in where they could unload it. So one day he said, Hey, he said, how would you like to be an engineer? I said, Well, I know about that. Well, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a dollar an hour more. It'll get you a dollar an hour more if you want to do that. Uh, maybe I'll go with you someday, make a with my boss. Oh yeah, I can do that. My boss was easy to get along with. Well yeah, he was go with him. So I rode with him, I went pick up with all them two maybe two uh, freight cars at the on the, at the switch track. Open the gate, pull the two cars through, switch it back to the sun and drill when we go into the to the base. And then we take it down where he had to be, unload that and stop and unhook it. Go down the reel and hook the switch track and come back to the engine house and park the engine. Not too bad. <laughs> for a buck an hour more, I can't can't turn that down. <laughs> so I done that for a while, a couple of years. And then he got rid of the locomotive. Didn't have enough business for it anymore. So then I lost my railroad job. So then the big boss <coughs> in transportation said, Well, how would you like to come over to the front office, work in the office? I guess I could. Okay. So I got seated in, in the office here in the front office. Took care of all the transportation business, the motor pool, the warehouse, and everything. And then I got into household goods. <coughs> and then one of the guys in the office there said, Well, he said, you know, we do have, have inspectors <coughs> that go around checking out the movers to see how they pack the stuff. And when they come back from overseas with it, see how much damage you got. And you wet, wet furniture, broken furniture, anything, you write it all up and turn it back in. Would you like that? I said, yeah. Give you a little extra money and get about another, so much an hour more. Anything more than my paycheck, I like that. <laughs> so I took that, and that's what I retired from. <laughs> what year was that? 1981. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I had 30 years of service time, and a year sick me. You give me 31 years. So you were gone about five years before I got to Scott Air Force Base and I was with transportation out there. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did you ever get anything you know what I mentioned? Pardon me? Into the household goods? I was, uh, air, transport <coughs> I was air transportation. Oh, air, okay. But it, <coughs> it was all the same squadron. Yeah. That was different. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, did you ever attend any uh, military reunions or anything like that? No, not really. Okay. Uh, once I got away from the, the military, I said, that's enough of that. I don't know <laughs> part of it. <clears throat> mm. Well, if you didn't want to know more part of it, then what made you join the veterans organizations then? Well, that was different. That was not military. Okay. <laughs> I, did, I, I just trying to, you know, some people say that and they, yeah. they exclude veterans organizations. That's why I was saying. No, I'm mean, commander for two years with the DAV and I was a commander one year with the POWs and I went up as high as a senior vice with the VFW <coughs> and I would have probably got to be the commander but I wound up in the hospital as, as a senior vice 
then nobody had the damn decency to come to the hospital and ask me, well, would you take the commander? No, they didn't do that. When the election came on, they just elected somebody else. And then when I got out of the hospital, I said, well, what happened to the election? Oh, sure, so that's what happened. And I said, thanks, thanks a lot. I went all through the church, junior and senior body, uh -huh. and I said, because I was laying in the damn hospital, you guys elect somebody else. <clears throat> so, I was pretty active in, in the VFW before that, but I kind of, if that's the way you want to operate, go ahead, without me. Did you go through the chairs at all with the American Legion? No. Be only because Albers Legion was in Albers, and I live in Carlisle. Okay. <clears throat> but too much, too far to drive. I just had a meeting once in a while with that about it. Okay. Yeah. DAV, I was very active with them. In fact, I helped organize Chapter 100 in Trenton. Okay. And when we started out, I had a whole car load from Carlisle with myself. I'd drive them to the meeting every, every meeting night. Of course, one died, and that one died. All of a sudden, I was by myself. And then, on the other side of Trenton, they were losing just about as many as I was. All of a sudden, they didn't even have enough to hold the, hold the meeting anymore. So we just shut it down and they transferred it over to Belleville. Okay. So, technically, I belong to Belleville DAV. Okay. But, but then they have never called on me or mentioned it. <laughs> so. I won't go there. I have the same issues with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, Not at this point. I don't even care. Right. <clears throat> Um, I saw a question here I wanted to ask. I'm trying to find it here. <laughs> oh, um, what similarities or differences do you see um, now as a veteran com compared uh, to those that serve in the military now? As a veteran now? In what, when, when, when uh, I was in the service? Yeah, you know, <laughs> as being a veteran now. <laughs> okay, I got you. And and what what's your uh, view well, okay. or compare, how do you compare to today's veterans? I don't think too much of it. They're, they're dis disciplined anymore. It's just when I started working at Scott Air Base, I was still used to a guy really when a sergeant was in charge, he was in charge, and you don't talk back to him. They say, hey, sergeant, you want that damn job done, do it yourself. I know you got That's a dirty work. Boy, I said, man, if you'd be in the Army, you wouldn't talk to him like that, but I found out later he'd do it there, too. Yeah, <clears throat> I think yeah. around the 80s, that stuff changed there. Their discipline isn't. They should never let up on it. <coughs> I agree with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> Is there uh, anything you'd like to add to this interview, Vince, that we didn't cover or something you want to elaborate on? No, I, I don't think so. I think we pretty well covered it. <laughs> You're getting hoarse, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have no more questions. If you don't have no more, I think that's be it. Yeah.